Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Today on Manifest, we brought our partners to a very interesting place, which is called Arad. Now, if you go into the Bible, you'll discover in the book of Numbers, where it talks about the king of Arad. And right before the Israelites came to this area, Aaron the high priest died, and Eleazar his son took his place. Then there were Israelites that were taken captive, and they had to come into the area of Arad, and they had to get those prisoners out. And right after that, Israel left this area, went back into the wilderness, and it was there that the story of the brass serpent on the pole is recorded in the book of Numbers by Moses. This is a very, very historic area. And as I have come here today, we want to share with you a very special uh, program on Manifest. And it, it may sound odd sharing that in this particular area, but this area was one once, and I say this area, I'm talking about all of Israel at one time, was full of bears and full of lions. If you'll remember, David said to, to that he killed the bear and he killed the lion when Saul was inquiring of him about his resume of why he felt like he could take on the Philistine. And I want to key up on something today that's very interesting, and that is how to build a hedge in your family against the power of the lion. How to build a hedge in your family against the power of the lion. One verse of scripture stands out in my mind. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and 10. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. And if you look at the word hedge, I was studying this before our trip, and I found out that there's a, about three different Hebrew words used in the Old Testament, key Hebrew words used for the word hedge, or should I say translated as the word hedge in our Bible. Job chapter 1 translates the word hedge that means a protective restraint. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30 translates it with a different word, goder, which is an enclosure or to encircle something. And then in Micah chapter 7 and verse 4, it's a totally different word that means to hedge in by thorns to take thorn bushes and to hedge in, for example, if it's sheep in a cave, you put the thorn bushes in front of the cave to keep the sheep from escaping. So there's several different words used in the Old Testament Hebrew language that's translated just as the word hedge in our Bible. The, the main, uh, you may say the main idea behind a word hedge is to encircle something or to hedge something in or fence something in. Now, the reason for a hedge if you have sheep is to keep sheep at night from escaping or getting out. This is why, for example, a shepherd would put stones in front of the entranceway of a cave or he would put thorn bushes there so that at night while he's... Uh, maybe you get drowsy at 2, 3, or 4 in the morning, the sheep would not wander, wander away. But also a wall, and these, these old ancient cities of Israel, the ruins, you see them many times in the early day. In fact, all of them were surrounded by walls. The walls were to keep the enemy out. So this is very significant that you have to understand the, the purpose of a hedge. Now, going a little bit deeper into that, in the book of Job, we talked about this uh, in Jerusalem the other day. In the book of Job, a hedge was removed, and when the hedge was removed, the enemy got in. I believe that what's happening in our homes today is I call it a crack in the armor. There is a crack that comes in the hedge, and somehow the serpent, which is Satan, or in this case, we're going to talk about the lion, enters in through the cracks or the openings that come in our particular hedge. Now, having said this about talking about the lion, what do I mean when I say keeping the lion out? I'm going to give you a nugget here. Most of you know this. In fact, I'm going to ask my partners to participate here. And when I give you a name from the Bible, tell me what you think it represents at one time. Ready? A dove. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and peace. Both of those are right. A snake. Satan, all of them got that right. Okay, you, you made an A so far. James 5, 14, what does oil represent? Anointing. The anointing in the Holy Spirit, or the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Water flowing, John chapter 7, verse 38. Oh, you get, now you're missing that one now. Think about it. Out of your belly. Well, yeah, you're right. Rivers of living water. See, I almost got you there, queen, didn't I? What does a rock represent in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? The rock is... A solid Christ, solid foundation. What does a lamb represent? That ought to be an easy one. 
Jesus, the lamb represents Christ. What does fire by night and a pillar of cloud represent? Protection, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, as the Jews would call it, the glory of His, his presence. He dwells in that cloud, so it's His presence. Uh, but also, let me just throw a nugget out here for you. It represents the two baptisms of the New Testament. When you're, the baptism in the sea was baptism in water. The baptism in the cloud is heavenly. That's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So you have two baptisms. You're, you're repentant and baptized in water, but you also can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is that heavenly gift. Now, I want to share something with you here that I think is interesting. Now, think about this for a moment. Of all the symbols that you can find in the Bible and all the symbols that you can find of Christ, there's only one that Satan wanted to copy. Only one. Nowhere in the Bible is Satan compared to a lamb except the false prophet is the lamb with two horns, which is a counterfeit Christ. That's the only other counterfeit picture other than what I'm going to show you. Satan wants to identify himself as a lion. And he wants to be a lion. Now stop and think about this for a moment, that Jesus, both King David and Christ, were born in Bethlehem, which is in the center of the tribe of Judah. And the main emblem of the tribe of Judah is the lion. And when you think about a lion, you have the lion that's on, for example, the British coat of arms or a British emblem. You have it on royal emblems, ancient emblems, because a lion represents the following. A lion represents authority. It represents strength. It represents kingship. It represents leadership. And Satan wants all four of those. And he wants to be like God. You know, he, he, the Antichrist, the Bible says, as God will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan has always wanted to be like God. And so as, when we look at Christ, Christ is, according to the book of Revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the enemy comes along, and the, the Bible tells us, the apostle Peter wrote, that Satan as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan wants to take on the lion emblem. You say, well, that's only found in, in, in Peter's writings. No, it's not. If you will go into the scripture, listen to what the Bible says. In Psalms chapter 91, I love telling this, when Satan tempted Jesus, he tempted him and said, if you'll bow and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world for they're delivered to me to whomsoever I will, I give them. And of course, Jesus in every uh, area of temptation, he quoted the scripture back against Satan. Watch what happens here though. All of a sudden, Satan starts quoting the scripture back to him, takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and says, cast yourself down for it's written. He will give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. If you're wanting to know the place where that's quoted from, it's in Psalms 91. Now, isn't it interesting that when Satan wanted to quote a scripture, he quoted one that he wanted to fit his situation with Jesus' temptation. But Satan had a lapse of memory. Because if you'll just go a few verses down from Psalms 91, here's what it says. You will tread upon the lion and the adder <laughs> and the young lion and dragon you shall trample underneath your feet. Now look at this, a lion, an adder, a dragon. The dragon is mentioned, you know, in the book of Revelation as a symbol of Satan, right? In Revelation chapter 12, etc. Then we have the adder, which is a poisonous serpent and Satan is identified as a serpent. So here now we have the word lion used knowing that the adversary would have the characteristics of a lion, just like the earthly lion has certain characteristics that are very dangerous. So Satan, the adversary, would. Isn't it funny? The devil quotes what he wants to quote. But he, he fell short of that one because, you know what? That predicted his doom by the Messiah. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to quote that scripture. Now, the thing that I want to share with you today is this. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power. And that Greek word there means legal authority to trample or tread on over all of the power. And that Greek word there means the ability or supernatural working of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus has given us the lion authority, if I could say that, the kingly authority. And I think one of the reasons that Satan wants to present himself as a roaring lion is he's always trying to counter the Messiah. He's always trying to be the opposite. He's the counterfeiter. And you know, the next way that Jesus returns, when Christ returns, he doesn't come as the suffering lamb. He comes as the lion. So the first time was the lamb. Second appearance is the lion. But as the lion, he becomes king. They tried to crown him king in Jerusalem, but it was not time for him to be king. It was time for him to suffer. So Satan knows that the, the lion represents kingship and authority. So let's look at this for a moment. How does an actual lion attack 
its victims. Let me give you four things that I call the ways of a lion. Number one, a lion goes after the weak and the sick and the wounded. In other words, its first prey will not be something strong. Its first prey will be something which is wounded. So the adversary wants to go after some of you who have wounds in your heart and wounds in your spirit and you're down right now and you have a hard time picking yourself up because it's hard for you to fight. Why do you think in James 5 it said, is there any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and pray. Can I tell you why? Because if you're really physically sick, you don't feel like praying. Have we been there? I mean, when you're really sick, you just use, oh God, oh God, I just can't pray today. So you have to call others who have faith to pray for you because you physically don't feel like it. Number two, in the ways of a lion, the lion seeks the one who has left the flock and is standing alone by themselves. You've got to understand there's power in numbers. There's power in a body. There's power in unity. When you are a part of a local congregation that can care for you and minister to, to you, love you, a pastor that will shepherd you, there's great strength in that. However, when you become isolated and you go out on your own, you will discover that that is the greatest opportunity, come on somebody, for the adversary to move into your life when you're standing alone. Here's the, here's the reason why. When you're standing alone, have a lot of time on your mind as well. And that's when the fiery darts of the enemy will work against your mind. The more time that you have that we call the idle time. Here's the third thing. A lion will move slow, but attack very, very sudden. So in other words, we call this the surprise attack. Now, if you know anything about how the lion operates, he sends the females out to check things out and he kind of lurks in the background. But when it comes time for him to make his move, he makes it so quick and so fast that that poor animal that is in need has no opportunity to escape. So this is the way of a lion. The fourth thing you need to understand about a lion, first of all, we need to understand about helicopters that fly by right in the middle of your teaching. We don't know who that is. I guess I, maybe they're one to hear the word. I don't know. This, that's not the way you do it. Just come on down the mountain and join the group. The fourth, the, the fourth, the fourth, this is what you get when you're taping as is, okay? So this is just all a part of it. Number four, in the ways of a lion, it literally devours its prey nothing remaining. In other words, once an, a lion uh, pounces on its prey, it will leave nothing but the carcass. So this is so parallel to the enemy. Let's look at it again. Going after you when you're weak and sick and wounded, going after you when you're standing alone, you've left the flock, going after you slow and then suddenly hitting you at one time with a major attack. And then once he hits you, attempting to devour you at some point and leaving nothing spiritually for you. Now in Africa, there's a very large animal called uh, a wilderbeest. And I'm sure our television producer will put a picture up of these animals right now. They have learned how to form, listen to this, a hedge against lions. Now this is a natural animal that lives in Africa that has to deal consistently with lions. And here's what they do. A wilderbeest will, will form, like if there's an, an animal that they're protecting a baby or one that maybe is injured, they will actually form a circle around that animal and lock horns. And, and, and as long as, oh, that'll preach right there. And see, let me say something to you because a lot of times in the body of Christ, that's what we don't do. So let, let me talk about ministries for a moment. Sometimes a minister will fall or a minister will have something happen in their life and the enemy, Satan, will come in and instead of the body of Christ circling them and trying to help them and saying, what happened here? Let's pray for you. You need to take some time off. Get with your family. You know what they do? They leave them alone to get devoured. They back away from them. I'll tell you what, wasn't that stupid? Yeah, that sure was. Well, if I was him, I wouldn't have done that. You better watch what you say. Because with the same judgment you judge, come on, I need to get an amen over here from somebody. With the same judgment you judge, it will be judged back to you again. So if you look at this, let me share, let me share with you something uh, here that's very, very important that I want to go back to a moment ago. And that is how does the adversary work in our lives? And I'm going to give you a nugget here. I was studying this the other day and I was thinking about the people that were addicted to alcohol, the people that were addicted to, addicted to drugs, people that were just really, uh, not just addicted, but they had real emotional problems in their life. And I said, God, what is the key? What is the one thing happening in people's lives that is getting the adversary into their life? Whether it be um, bitterness or strife or unforgiveness, which is one aspect, or whether it be demonic activity in their life, What's the key? And I meditated on this and all of a sudden the Lord spoke to me and he gave me one word. He said, the one word, son, the one word is the word wound. Everyone that has an addiction, if you'll trace it back, they have been wounded somewhere. Everyone that has a marriage and 
go from one marriage to the next. If you'll go check it out, originally they have a wound somewhere. Satan is getting into more people's lives right now because of emotional, not, I'm not talking about physical wounds, but emotional and spiritual wounds. There's people that won't even go to church today because they got offended by a pastor. They got offended by the church members. They got offended by somebody in the church. They got offended by something they didn't get half, you know, so they get a wound in their spirit. Now listen to what, listen to this scripture in Psalms 102, 22 through 27, for I'm poor and needy. My heart is wounded within me. I am gone like the shadow when it declines. I'm tossed up and down as the locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My flesh fell with the fatness. I am become also a reproach unto them. When they look upon me, they shook their heads. Help me, O Lord, and save me according to thy mercy, that they may know uh, that, that, that they may know that this is thine hand and that the Lord has done it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14 says, The spirit of a man will sustain his, inf his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear it and so i want to i want to address this for just a moment and tell you that the greatest danger that you have because we're talking about forming a hedge to keep the lion out the greatest way that the adversary as a roaring lion coming and seeking whom he may devour gets into your life is by an offense or a wound that happened to you an emotional offense or a wound that took place with words in fact i wrote this down there's three kinds of words there's there's faith killing words there's family killing words and then there's future killing words faith Killing words are like this. Well, I can't believe it. I don't know where God is. I don't know why God hasn't moved on my behalf. I'm just upset because I pray and pray and nothing's happening. What that is, those words are killing your faith. We have the second level, which are family killing words, where people get in arguments and they say things like, I hate you. I wish you'd never been born. Why don't you get out of my life? You're going to be nothing but a failure. Those kind of words are family killing words. And then you have the third level, which I call future killing words, where you look at someone and say, well, you're not going to make it. You're going to end up like your dad. You're going to end up like your uncle in prison and so you're killing people's future and so the, the important thing thing is this I've often said the person that said sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt, uh, hurt me must have been deaf yes. because I'm just telling you that is not true words destroy people words get in people's heart and get into their spirit it destroys their life and their heart it destroys their future and so what I want to share with you today that if you feel like that you have been wounded by someone understand that what the wound does is it opens up a crack in the hedge or it puts a crack in your armor and so the Bible says when the hedge is broken a serpent will bite will bite that person so you have to keep the hedge closed in now someone said okay how do you do this well let me just explain something to you from the New Testament I'm, I'm sorry from the prophecy of Isaac Isaiah chapter 53. The Messiah that came, this is Isaiah chapter 53. The majority of that prophecy there is a prophecy that deals with what we call the suffering Messiah. Now, the Bible says that he would, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. And then it says he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity. Now, the, in the, when you come into the New Testament, you see Jesus in the garden and he's in the garden of Gethsemane praying and his sweat is becoming, as it were, great drops of blood. And what is happening there, I believe, is that he that knew no sin became sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what's happening is that G the sins uh, uh, are being placed upon Jesus for him to carry them as the atoning final sacrifice. But not only that, if you read in Matthew's gospel, it, one of the translations is he was made sin with our sins and sick with our sicknesses. Because Isaiah 53 also says, by his stripes we are healed. So here's what we see taking place. In the Garden of Gethsemane, not only does Jesus carry the sin that would cause him to go to the cross and be our final sacrifice so that we could be free from sin, but Jesus Christ in his suffering also carried the grief. He also carried the sorrow. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The bottom line is that Jesus Christ bore, please hear this, every type of of sin wound, every type of emotional wound, and every type of spiritual wound, because you are a body and a soul and a spirit. The body is physical, the soul is mental, the spirit is the eternal part of you. So you have emotional wounds, you have physical wounds, you have spiritual wounds, but Jesus Christ bore all of them. Now, if he bore them, I ask you this question, why would you want to carry them? 
Why would you want to carry something he's already born? You know, in the time of the book of Leviticus, when the priest would take that scapegoat, remember that? On the Day of Atonement, and he would lay his hands on that goat and transfer all the sins of Israel onto the head of that goat, and they would send that goat, and it looked like this, into a wilderness, and one priest would take a rope and run that goat over to that hill, and the next priest would run it to the next, the next, and eventually they pushed it off of a cliff on the Mount of the Ezezel, which is outside of Jerusalem, never to bring it up again. But the point is, the sin symbolically was placed on that goat. So Israel did not have to worry about carrying their sin once the goat took the sin. We don't worry about carrying our sin, right? I mean, all of us here are forgiven. We don't think about, boy, I'm just carrying that sin. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. Boy, I just have to... No, we have confidence. So why can't we have confidence in that he will heal the wound, which is sealing up the hedge, sealing up the cracks in the armor? Because I'm telling you, the biggest thing some of you are dealing with right now is offense, hurt, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And you've opened up an area that the enemy just keeps tormenting you and he keeps coming against you in your mind and spirit to where you can't get victory over it. You've got to understand that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he did more than die on the cross and become a sacrifice for sin. Read Isaiah chapter 53, where he took grief, he took sorrow. Well, that's what you experience when someone dies is grief and sorrow. So in other words, he takes the sting out of death for us so that if we have family members that have died in Christ, we don't have to sorrow as Paul said others do because we know where they're at. And so what I'd like to do is just, just take a moment and just share with you this opportunity of allowing Christ through your own prayer and through your own faith to say, Jesus, I need your help. You know, David said, I'm wounded, but he said, I cried out to the Lord for help. You see, the Lord will hear you if you will simply cry out to him and say, God, I really need your help. I need you to deliver me and pray for him to bring kingdom connections into your life. Pray for him to bring people into your life that can help you and, and bring us support base to you as well, because I believe it's the will of God to, to keep a hedge up a, a, against the lion and keeping that hedge up by not allowing wounds to come into our spirit, which is the one thing the enemy uses the most.